We'd like to welcome all of you to uh, this lecture this morning uh, to hear Dr. Gabriel Di Meglio. Uh, we'd first like to thank uh, Dr. Greg Stallings of the Spanish and Portuguese Department for uh, sharing his musical talent with us. Uh, you heard uh, La Marcha de San Lorenzo in there, some tango, and some other Argentine songs that he's been uh, working on for the last uh, few days. So thanks, uh, thanks, Greg. And it just so happens to be according to my sources, that today is San Martin's birthday, Jose de San Martin's birthday. So that's a happy coincidence uh, for half of South America. Um, so, and really for the world, but specifically for half of South America. All right, well, my name is uh, Jeff Shumway. I'm a professor in the history department, and it's my pleasure to again welcome you here to uh, this, this lecture. We have asked, uh, um, and the technical staff has asked me, this isn't sacrament meeting, but for, so that people don't have to crawl over you to some of these spots in the middle. I know you don't like this when it happens in a sacrament meeting, but if you can squeeze in a little, because some people are still looking for seats up here, uh, out here. Um, so if you don't mind doing that, it's for technical reasons and for your safety. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, we would like to start out today with, uh, with a prayer we've asked. Uh, Henry Guajardo to offer our opening prayer, and then I will introduce uh, Dr. Di Meglio formally. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be here this Thursday morning and have a chance to hear from Gabriel Di Meglio talk about Argentine history. We're grateful to celebrate 200 years of history of this great country, Argentina, and we're thankful for all the culture, cultural contributions that, um, that um, the Argentine people have given us. We're grateful for a chance to gain some insights on uh, occurrences that have happened and learn a little bit more about the revolution of 1810 and, and 1816. We pray that the Spirit will be with us all so that we can learn and understand. We pray that um, God will bless Mr. Demeglio so that he can um, have a safe return journey, and we're thankful that he's come all this way to speak to us. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you, Michael. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gabriel Demeglio. Uh, our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Dimeglio is from Buenos Aires. He got his doctorate at the University of Buenos Aires where he now uh, teaches. He is also a uh, member of CONICET, which is uh, a large institution that, separate from the universities, that funds uh, researchers throughout the country. Um, and it, it's a very prestigious appointment to be a, a part of, of CONICET. Dr. Di Meglio has published uh, a number of books and articles. This is just a selection of some of his publications. Uh, you can see there the bottom, kind of middle to the right there. Uh, when he got his degree, the, there was kind of hard times to find a job, so he and some friends started a tour company in Buenos Aires. And so he, uh, he took a lot of tourists around uh, Buenos Aires, uh, teaching them kind of deeper historical uh, tours than just the average. Um, and his latest book is this one here, on the, the big one here on the left, about Manuel Dorrego, um, one of the uh, very important Federalist leaders in the 1820s in, in Buenos Aires. So uh, any of these are recommended. I just finished reading the one on the right. It's great, uh, a great book about uh, La Mazorca and, and other things. Uh, maybe because of his past as a tour guide, he really, he really showed his stuff uh, earlier this week, hiking Angel's Landing. So I don't think he even stopped for breath one time uh, heading, up, heading up to the top. So he's, he's quite, the, uh, quite the hiker. Uh, besides doing all of this history stuff, Dr. Di Meglio also uh, is a TV personality. And here is the introduction to uh, one of his shows. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
So uh, fortunately, fortunately, he looks just as good standing up as he does lying down in front of a TV camera. And, but with no further ado, let's uh, welcome Dr. DiMeglia and let's give him another hand. Well, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, for me, it is, um, sorry, I have to go back. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank the um, BYU for inviting me, and especially Professor Shanway, and also Professor Mark Wilson, for the possibility of being here today. For me, it's an honor. Uh, I will talk to you today about, you know, this year we have the bicentennial of the independence of what today is Argentina, and uh, this presentation focuses on the political process that led to it, you know, because in, in Argentina we have two national dates that are equally important, right? One is May the 25th, when the revolution started in 1810, which is associated with that building on the left, and it happened in Buenos Aires, you know? That is the colonial town hall of Buenos Aires. And six years later, uh, the country declared its independence, right, in July the 9th, 1816. And that would happen in another city, which is Tucumán, inside Argentina, in that house that you can see on the right, right? So I will focus on what happened between both dates and why there's a delay in between the revolution to the, to the um, independence, right? Of course, you know, the. The period of emancipation opened in 1810 uh, has always taken a lot of historiographical, historiographical attention because it's the, the beginning of the country. Uh, but in the, in the last decade, there has been a lot of new research that challenged the previous narratives about the Argentine independence, right? So um, we have had many, in, I would say the last 30 years, many changes that dramatically turn how we think of the, the independence, especially in four, sorry, it, there in four ways, you know, uh, as you can see there. Today we know that there was not an in Argentine national identity before the revolution, as it was thought before, right? That identity was constructed slowly after the independence, okay? We know also that it's impossible to study the Argentine independence isolated from it con its context, right? What happened in the, in the rest of the continent as it was done before. Okay? Independence was not planned or even desired, but by very few people before 1810, right? And it was not the first goal of the majority of revolutionaries. This is another change in how we think of the period. And also, there was not only a small group of wealthy white men running the process, where traditional historiography always focused, right, in the leaders of the revolution and the independence, the, the big guys, the, the generals, right? And, but other actors were cru crucial as well, because the revolution involved the whole population, okay? So I will talk about these four uh, topics, okay? And, and then I, uh, in the end, I will just give a very brief conclusion. So first, the thing about identity, right? You know, people in that period, beside consider all themselves uh, Christians, right? I mean, they were Catholic, but they called themselves Christians, right? Um, had two important types of identity, right? People had the identity of the place one had been born in, right? For example, someone in Buenos Aires uh, is called Porteño, so he, he, he called himself a Porteño or herself, and someone from Salta or from Cordoba were Salteños and, and, and uh, Cordobeses, so the, the identity was very strong in the place you were born in, okay? And also the other identity they had was to be, um, we call them Americans, they call themselves Americans, you know, Americanos, right? or Europeans. So there was nothing in the middle of being of your city or, or your area and America, right? There were no uh, national identity in the whole Latin America at that moment, right? So those identities that we know today, the, the, the nation state identity, were built after the revolutionary process that uh, put an end to the Spanish empire in, in that part of the world, okay? So um, the name, the term Argentina, Argentina, right, uh, was used in that moment more poetically for people that live near the Rio de la Plata, you know? <coughs> I, I brought a map here. Uh, this is the map of the, of the former viceroyalty of the Rio de la Plata, right? 
that included what today is Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia, right? And you can see it on the, there. But a big part of what today is Argentina was, as you can see in the map, uh, controlled by indigenous groups until the late 19th century. The Spaniards never conquered that part that is in, in brown, right? So um, the name Argentina, Argen you know, comes from Argentum, that in Latin means silver, plate, right? So the people near the Rio de la Plata, you know, this big river, the widest river that you have on, on the right, right? Um, the people were called Argentinos uh, poetically if you live near the river, right? But it was not a name used by the rest uh, of, the pop of the population of the different provinces that were included in what today is Argentina. So the name slowly, as an identity, was developed alongside the 19th century. Do you follow me? Okay. All right, so, uh, and you can see that this lack of, ide of, of uh, Argentine identity when, when you see the name that the country adopted in, in the independence in 1816. It was called United Provinces in South America. That was the, the first name of our country, right? That, of course, has some re resemblance of United States of America, right? Because there was a strong influence of, of, the, of the American Revolution in that moment. Well, besides this, two types of, of identities, the local one and the Americana one, uh, there was another kind of, of very strong identity in the period that was ethnic, okay? Uh, being considered white, Indian, or member of a caste, you know, black, mestizo, uh, Afro-mestizo, you know, gave different rights because the colonial society was founded on juridical inequality, okay? So uh, as we'll see, this was challenged during the, the revolutionary years, okay? So this for the first topic, identity, right? Second, the, the problem of context, okay, the global view. Uh, when you go to school in Argentina, you study the independence process as something unique, right? Y and then you see what happened in the rest of the Hispanic American world. You know, you s first study as the most important thing, the Argentina thing. If you go to Chile, they do the same thing. If you go to Paraguay, they do the same thing. To Mexico, I mean, the, the country is more important, okay? But in fact, uh, what we, <clears throat> what we know today is that, um, I mean, the academic historiography from different countries has shown that, that it is a mistake and that the local events have to be seen at the same time with what happened in the rest of the Spanish Empire because there was an imperial collapse. Today, there's a consensus about this, right? Nowadays, most historians agree in considering the crisis in Spain in 1808, right, when it was invaded by the French of Napoleon, right, and the uh, who forced the Spanish king, Ferdinand VII, to advocate and gave the crown to his own brother, Joseph Bonaparte, right? That was the start. Uh, so that was not just an excuse used by colonists to rebel, but a powerful cause, right? The acephalous realm moved elites to action to replace the king, and thus new possibilities were opened, right? But what divides historians is about how they consider that crisis of 1808. Right? For some, it was totally unexpected. The sudden break in this sovereignty, that's a difficult word to pronounce in English for me, <laughs> right? Sovereignty, right? Soberania in Spanish. So the, 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 the sudden break in the sovereignty produced an outcome no one would have think of a couple of years before, right? So for this branch of historians, uh, the, the revolution was sort of ray in a blue sky, you know, it's something totally unexpected. Everything was okay and suddenly, this event broke everything. Other historians, and, and I stand there, right, take 1808 as a surprise, but no, I mean, no one expected it, but, that, but it can only be understood because the empire was going through a long crisis, right? So the revolution was not a ray in a blue light, but it was like a sparkle on a dry grass, right? So uh, it had something where it was based, okay? So the collapse of the central authority made local tensions to rise, and new horizons were imagined by the colonists, right? And of course, these uh, new alternatives were possible because we have to, as, uh, as historians do today, include these Spanish-Americans revolutions in what today is called the age of revolution, right? I mean, that, uh, I mean, what happened in France and in Haiti and in the Andean Revolution of 1780, right? The one led by Tupac Amaru and Tupac Katari, 
was in the minds of the revolutionaries, but as well as the American Revolution. So they had all this experience before. For example, the slave revolt in what now is Haiti and the Indian revolt in, in, in the Andes made the, even the more radical revolutionaries in, in Spanish America to be more cautious of, of you know, popular mobilization because they were afraid of which consequences they, they could um, provoke, right? Um, but also, <coughs> uh, those revolutions give you know the, the notions of uh, sovereignty, again, <laughs> of the people, of equality, of consent as the base of government, of challenging established hierarchies, and all of this was circulating, right? Uh, so everything could be proposed in that moment. And, and also we have to think that the Hispanic revolutions were not just a derivation from the others. You know, they had all, also their own roots, their own political tradition, the Spanish tradition. But I would say that we can't understand the age of revolution if we don't include the Spanish revolutions and the, then the Portuguese revolution that led uh, to Brazil now, even the Greek revolution, right, of 1820. So that, that made the whole idea of this great change from where our modern world was born, right, this age of revolution. Okay, so this is the context, right? So, so I said, we don't think, uh, we know that now that the, we didn't have a, an identity uh, already done. We know now that the, there was not a, um, that we have to think of the, of, of the Argentine revolution in, in, as, as, a, as part of a bigger one. Uh, and then the problem of independence, right? Um, of course, traditionally, when you go to school and, and, and still in some academic <coughs> historiography, the independence is always seen, as it happens in Mexico, or in Chile, in Brazil, whatever, as the goal of the revolutionaries, right? They always, you know, you think from the outcome. You say that uh, as the outcome was independence, so that was thought from the beginning. Today we know that that's not the case, right? Because since it was clear that after the French Revolution uh, of 1789, right, the Spanish Empire was in crisis, there were many thinkers uh, all around this, the empire trying to find solutions, right? They wrote about how to innovate, how to modernize the empire, but they were not thinking of breaking with the monarchy. They were thinking of how to improve it, okay? For example, Manuel Belgrano, one of the later, one of the most important revolutionaries, uh, and today one of the most important national figures, right, in, in Argentina, was one of these guys who were thinking not of independence, so, but they were thinking how to modernize, how to change the empire for the, for the good, right? Um, so almost nobody talked about independence. Uh, in, in very few did after the British invasion that took Buenos Aires in 1806, right? Uh, and the, the vast majority thought that the victory over those British and af uh, on a second invasion that came to Buenos Aires again in 1807, right, both were defeated by the local population, but most of the population of Buenos Aires took that as a victory of uh, His Majesty, right? So they dedicated it to the Spanish king, and this was a few years before the, the revolution, right? Um, it is true that the triumph over the invasion, the invasions brought several changes, you know? In Buenos Aires, a new militia was created, but not by the colonial authorities, but by the population itself, you know? And, um, and also an assembly gathered and they decided to put the viceroy out of power. Of course, a local population couldn't do that. And even if they, maybe they didn't know that, they were challenging the, the, the power of the king, but they didn't did it, I mean, openly talking about independence, okay? In spite of that, uh, loyalty to the imprisoned king was the main reaction when Napoleon invaded Spain and, um, and, and he put uh, Ferdinand VII, the seventh in, in prison, right? You follow me? So things changed in 1810. You know, when the news of the total collapse of Spain by the new French invasion uh, came to Buenos Aires, as to Caracas, to Bogotá, to Santiago de Chile, uh, several cities, right, uh, decided to form local juntas, that's how these governments were called, as uh, they, they had been done in Spain before, so to govern themselves until the legitimate king came back to power, okay? 
Of course, this was not innocent. You know, the, the aspiration of self-government was strong among the elites, right? But it's not the same to think of self-government than to think of independence, right? This is important. That, that's what historians have discovered late. I mean, they wanted to keep their resources at home, you know, and to elect their own authorities. They want not to depend anymore from Spain, but they want to do that inside the monarchy, right? So in, in fact, the revolution of 1810 was reclaiming a federal monarchy, you know? So it's not the same to depend on Spain, the metropoly, than to depend from the Spanish king. You know? so, so they were loyal to the king, but not to Spain. Okay. So that, that, that's something that for today, today it's difficult to understand, but in that moment it was quite clear, right? It is very similar to what happened later in the British Commonwealth, right? When you think of Canada or, or uh, Australia as dominions that elected their own authorities, but they respected the, the English queen or, or, or king, right? So it was the same thing. That, that's that's this, the first project of the, um, of the revolution, right? But there were divergences on that topic very quickly, right? The moderate branch of the junta maintained the idea of, of this uh, federal monarchy, but the radical branch wanted the revolution to go against hierarchies and to establish freedom, right? At the same time, the most important leader of the radical branch of the junta, just this is 1810, who was called Mariano Moreno, a very important historical character in Argentina, Mariano Moreno, he said, he wrote in the press that they love the imprisoned king Ferdinand VII, right? But he wrote, if we think more deeply, I mean, Ferdinand VII has no right to be our king, right? Because the Spaniards made the conquer of America by force, you know? And so the Americanos didn't consent to be the subjects of the king. So in fact, he has no right to be our king, but we love him, you know? <laughs> so, because you know, he knew that he was a politician, he knew that most of the people were for the king, right? But the idea of independence is already there. So from the very beginning, from 1810 to, to 1816, there was this division among the revolutionaries, right? They were both, I mean, all of them were fighting against the loyalists that didn't want any change, that they want, wanted to be loyal to any authority that remained in Spain, right? The revolutionaries didn't want any more links with Spain. Okay? But they were divided about this thing. So there were two, two brands. You know, you have the, the autonomists who wanted the, you know, wanted the compromise to assure self-government inside the monarchy, and the independentists who wanted to create a new state. You know, this is what we know today. Uh, the, so uh, from 1810 to 1816, you had these two branches you know, in, in tension. The conflict was resolved when Napoleon, Napoleon, right, was defeated in Europe in 1814, and Ferdinand VII came to power again, to his throne in Spain. And the king didn't want to negotiate anything, no, no compromise, right? So for the, for the local uh, rebels, there was just one option, or they win or they lose everything, okay? So when a congress was um, gathered in Tucumán in 1816, everybody was for independence because they didn't have another chance. Until 1816, some of the leaders thought that it was a better idea to fight for a different monarchy than, to, than the possibilities of a new state to survive, okay? But of course, after the independence, I know Tucumán, uh, you can't see it from there, but it's, it's like, can you see this, the, the, the light blue part on the left? Like in the middle, <laughs> right? It's like a city inside Argentina. Right? That's where the Congress was, uh, was called, and there it was the Declaration of Independence, July 9, 1816, that we celebrate this year. But the new country had other problems to solve, right? Was it going to be a republic or a monarchy? Even a new monarchy, right? Independent. Was it going to be centralist or federalist? Okay. When we say federalist in Argentina, it's not what maybe in the US is federalist, right? I mean, the the federals in Argentina are more close to what here were the anti-federals, right? Federalists, and, and the centralists wanted a, a strong government and a strong, uh, and no federalism at all, right? They, they were more thinking of a French model, but to understand that federalists wants more, you know, the, the uh, 
choose to defend the states in Argentina, the, the provinces, okay? So, re republic or monarchy? Man many revolutionaries were republicans, but after, after 1815, when the Congress of Vienna were, was uh, gathering in, in Europe, and the absolutist monarchies that defeated Napoleon created this call Holy Alliance, right, that said any government born from a revolution must be destroyed, they were afraid, right? So uh, they didn't have any, any support from other countries. So um, some of these former Republicans thought that a monarchy, an independent monarchy, could be better accepted by these European monarchies, right? And so they started to, to think who could be a king, right? So there were some, you know, diplomatic people uh, fight, looking for kings in Europe, like uh, the, the brother of Ferdinand VII or uh, an Italian Dutch, you know? And, and the most important uh, project was the one that Manuel Belgrano proposed to the Congress in 1816, that was to have an Inca king, you know? The former Incas that had been, you know, the, the ones who, who well, uh, were the owners of the region before the Spanish came, had some, you know, descendants, and there was one guy that, who was the, the nephew of Tupac Amaru, the one that had reveled in uh, uh, 40 years before, 30 years before. And so Belgrano proposed him to be the, uh, the king and to put the capital in Cusco, you know, the, the former capital of the Inca Empire. So th that would give the revolution, you know, more support of the indigenous groups. That's why the name of the country is United Provinces in South America, because nobody knew which part of South America could be in and could be out. In the moment he proposed that, Cusco was still controlled by the loyalists, right? But he thought that in the future they could have created, uh, you know, a new monarchy with this Inca king. The project didn't work, but there's one track of this in our flag. You know, the, the Argentine flag has, you know, this, this uh, white, blue, uh, white and white blue strips, you know, which was, was taken from the Spanish tradition because the, the, the Bourbon dynasty used these colors, right, as, 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 as to identify themselves. But Belgrano added an Inca sun. You know, the sun in the middle is from the Inca tradition to, to give the flag an Americano symbol, okay? It's the only thing that lasted from that Inca project. Um, but finally, the Republican system was established everywhere and Republicans had, uh, after some years of, of, of discussions and debates, won, uh, won, won with their ideas, okay? The problem of federalism lasted long, you know? Uh, when the revolution started in Buenos Aires, the colonial capital, that, that was Buenos Aires, replace Spain uh, in saying who were going to be authorities in every province. And as year went by, some provinces started to be tired of this and they challenged the capital, okay? Many nowadays Argentine provinces, plus what today is Uruguay, in that moment called the Banda Oriental, right? Separated from the provinces under Buenos Aires and created in 1814 a confederation, the so-called, in Spanish, Liga de los Pueblos Libres, would be like the, the League of the Free, you know, the, the word Pueblo in Spanish has diff different meanings, right? Of, it could be of the free people and also of the free villages, right? Both things can, ha can be in the name. C can you see in the map, there's, on the right, there's a white blue area which is different from the other white blue area on the, on the left, right? This one on the right is the League that, that, you, that was really big, right? That was a confederation without a capital while the other provinces follow Buenos Aires in a centralist si system. So when the revolution was declared in 1816, all this area on the right was not part of the Congress. They didn't want to be in, a, in, the, in the same system with Buenos Aires. So there was not just one revolution fighting against the loyalists and the Spaniards in that moment, but also there were two systems having a civil war at the same time that they were fighting against the other. So th that's why the process is very complicated to follow, okay? The leader of this Liga de los Pueblos Libres uh, is very famous, and today he's the most important national figure in Uruguay, was Jose Artigas, right? A, a very important character 
of the period. So their followers were called the Artigists because of his name. Okay. Um, so the league lasted for some years, but Artigas was defeated by a Portuguese invasion. You know that the Portugal always wanted the Rio de la Plata to be its southern limit. Okay, so they invaded in 1816 uh, the, the, that area that today is Uruguay. And Buenos Aires saw that invasion with good eyes because they say, okay, kill Artigas, finish with him, right? So the, the league didn't survive the defeat of Artigas and it split. But in fact, this was not the end of it. I mean, uh, today I'm talking just about this decade of 1810 when the country was created. But the problem of federalism and centralism, or also called unitarianism, right? The idea of a unique sovereignty, right? So it's the, it, they were called unitarios, unitarians, right? So the problem between federalists and unitarians lasted for years, and there were several problems and civil wars until federalists could prevail and Argentina was created as a federal country, a federal republic in the 1850s. Okay, but this is another story. All right, so the last topic, uh, participation. You follow me, right, right here? I have, you know, this problem of saying you follow, like it's something I, I develop as a teacher. <laughs> um, okay, so, the participation, besides the leaders, like Belgrano, like Moreno, like Artigas, like San Martin, you know, um, that were mostly white men from the upper classes, the revolution involved many more people in crucial roles, right? The women of the elite uh, of different provinces became politically important, right? Organizing meetings and discussing politics. That's w one very famous one is one that is now being, being studied by, by Professor Shanway, you know, Mariquita Sanchez de Thompson, Mariquita was very famous because she organized at home, you know, meetings that in fact had a very strong political uh, resonance, right? Um, for example, in 1813, an anonymous writer published a, a, a libel, you say libel, libel? Uh, libel, thank you, against women discussing politics. Uh, women don't have to enter politics because they were already doing that, right? So that was one of the changes the revolution brought. And also men and women uh, from the lower class classes enter politics too. You know? In Buenos Aires, that was open when factional struggle started. You know, remember this first government I told you, the Junta? You know, when the conflict between moderates and radicals in the Junta started, the problem was, how do you win this conflict? I mean, there, are, there were no rules. I mean, be, before, in the colonial times, if a group of power in Buenos Aires or in any part of what today is Argentina, had a problem with another one, what did they do? They, if, if, if the, you made me use a modern term, they did lobby in, in Spain, right? So the, the king or the council of Indias could say, they are right, they win, right? But with the interruption of the link with the, with the monarchy, how can you define a struggle, you know? So, um, The revolution started to look below in the social hierarchy, right? Uh, so in, in to mobilize people to the street, and that opened uh, a gate to the entrance in politics to people that had not been in it before. You know? So the entrance of the popular sectors helped to transform the revolution against the colonial authorities in a revolution against all the Spaniards. Because in the beginning, the junta were not talking against, was not talking against all the Spaniards. They say, we are against, in Spanish, the mandones, right? The tyrants, against these colonial authorities that abuse of us, right? But they were not talking about all the Spaniards. When, uh, but for the common people, the Spaniards were the problem, all of them, right? So they helped, you know, by pressure, by, by, by different mobilizations through the squares, and uh, especially in Buenos Aires, to, um, uh, to move the revolution against Spaniards, to make it something, a, a cause against all the Spanish, okay? Uh, so those who had a subaltern place in the colonial period found in the new cause of the revolution, uh, they didn't talk about the revolution, they talk about the cause of the patria, the fatherland, right? They were pat patriots. Uh, and they found there a, a way to symbolic ascension, right? Uh, because uh, 
they had a new place in community while being the good ones against the bad Spaniards, right? So if people from the castes and uh, that, that, that had a, an inferior situation before could find themselves like uh, more important than the Spaniards, right? So that caused a big change in, in the society, right? So in some parts of the Rio de la Plata territory with important social and racial tensions, the coming of the revolution gave place to big popular mobilizations that fought for independence, but also for more changes. The followers of Artigas in what today is Uruguay, you know, on your right, in, in the Banda Oriental, um, shouted, no one is more than no one. That was the slogan, right? And the idea of, of equality, right? And reclaim a land reform. Northern, you know, in what uh, was the, the, the area of the near Paraguay, you know, uh, of the former Jesuit missions, the, the Guarani Indians wanted to reconstruct the Jesuit province, but without the priests and without any whites in them. Okay, so that was their own uh, project that is being researched today, right? It's something very new. On the left, you know, on the upper part of the white blue uh, color, you know, that's Salta, you know? And in Salta, the so-called gauchos fought a guerrilla war against the loyalists, and while doing it, they stopped paying the rent to the landowners, right, during all, all these years. So the revolution made a lot of changes, you know, in how the society was, and caused a lot of, you know, not panic, but some, uh, the I mean, the upper classes were, were worried about what was happening, right? And, and another thing was what you do with the slaves. You know, slavery was really important in the Viceroyalty of the Rio de la Plata. You know? For example, in Buenos Aires, in 1810, 25% uh, of the population was, uh, were its slaves. You know? so, and the revolutionaries knew very clearly that, that there was a contradiction you know, of making a revolution in the name of liberty and having slaves. You know, you know in the states that ha happened the same, right? So uh, they say, well, well, we have two rights, you know, the right of freedom and the right of property. So how can we deal with that? Without, if we emancipate the slaves, we are against property, and also the slaves, they say, are not prepared for liberty. So what can we do? So in 1812, the government, the revolutionary government, prohibited the traffic of slaves. So no more slaves could be bought from Africa or from Brazil, right? So any slave who would land it in Buenos Aires or in any part of the Rio de la Plata area would be free in the moment, in the moment okay? This was 1812. The, year, the next year, in 1813, uh, there was a law of free birth. You know, so every son or daughter of a slave uh, was free from that moment on, since 1813. So they say, if we don't buy any more slaves and no more slaves are born, so when the nowadays slaves are dead, they were not, so we, we, uh, we won't have any more uh, slavery, right? So it will be like a gradual finish. That was okay for them, but not for the slaves who wanted the freedom in, in, in that moment. So there was a strong pressure of the slaves for, for liberty, right? There was a possibility for men, not for women, in the army, because as the war against the loyalists and the civil wars between federalists and centralists became to be longer, the draft was a problem, the population didn't want to go to war, so uh, the state, the revolutionary state, started to uh, call slaves to the arms, okay? And when a slave entered the army, he was, he had a promise of freedom. He was not free in that moment. He was like a sort of middle between freedom and, and slavery, what was called liberto, right? The liberto was not free, but he had a promise of freedom when he finished his service, right? And that was really important because slaves wanted to go and, and some masters gave them and some, other, uh, uh, some others were bought by the state to go to the army. For example, you know, in the most important military campaign of the, revo of the Revolutionary War, that was when Gen General San Martin crossed the Andes Mountains, you know, on the left, to attack the, the loyalists that controlled Chile, he, he had more than 5,000 soldiers. From that 5,000, 1,500 were slaves, the infantry, okay? Because uh, he liked, you know, he said that the, the, the slaves as, as, as uh, infant soldiers, uh, but also because many, many slaves wanted to go there, okay? So after the revolution you had, if you see a census, you see much more women slaves than men slaves because, because of this, this entrance in the army. But slavery was not abolished until 
the National Constitution of 1853. 1853. Okay, so to finish, um, once independence was declared, all the efforts were given to the campaign laid by San Martin to cross the Andes and attack the royalists in, in Chile, right? After defeating them, he went on to invade Peru, you know, on, uh, on the top, uh, to, the, to the left, um, that was the royalist bastion in the region, right? The confluence of San Martin from the south and Bolivar from the north caused the final collapse of the Spanish dominance in South America, right? Meanwhile, the government in the Rio de la Plata, you know, in the new country, the, the, this, this new United Provinces collapsed. It couldn't maintain its power over the provinces, and in 1820, it was dissolved. So only provinces remain without an authority over them. For the following 60 years, there was going to develop a complex process of state building that was the construction of Argentina. But in 1820, everything looked like a whole disaster. It was no central authority, just provinces living together. Okay? So what did the revolution bring to this society, right? Between 1810 and 1820, there were many things that changed. One, those who had been subjects of a monarchy now were Republican citizens. Okay, that's a big change. Second, the caste system, this idea of that if you were not white, you had less rights than the white, collapsed, right? Now there was judicial equality. Of course, the Argentine society remained racist, but it was not, this racism was not legal anymore. It didn't give uh, different rights, okay? Third, the economy changed. Free trade was adopted after the Spanish monopoly, right, by every province and it started a stronger connection with the Atlantic market, especially by selling hides and salted meat. And that caused, this was this, the model Argentina had to uh, rise economically for in, in the second half of the second half of the 19th century. So this rise of the, of, of, of the economy caused the rise of a new powerful class in the, all the Buenos Aires and the Pampas area, you know, on the right, which were the landowners that were not important in the colonial times, but it started to be really, really important after it. Right? And also the new importance of the countryside and the problems of the central government during the revolutionary years to conduct war allowed some local figures with capacity of mobilizing people and resources to acquire power. Right? These were the future so-called caudillos, right? Who used to include popular demands in their programs. So no one could be a successful political leader in 19th century Argentina without being a popular leader, right? So that was one of the strong, you know, uh, inheritance of the revolution, right? That this popular presence in politics that were really one of the keys of uh, how Argentina was constructed. Okay, that would be all. Okay, well, we do have a few minutes for questions. I know that some of you ha have to leave for class soon, but uh, Dr. Dimeglia is welcome to uh, entertain questions from students and, and faculty. And so if you wanna just stand up or come up here, you can, or just stand up and speak loudly. Maybe we can wait for some people to clear out. Have a migration. Yeah, many have to go to class. Mm. Okay, okay. 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 Los Andes, ¿no? no, San Martín. San Martín. San Martín. Y él se fue hasta Perú sí. y 
Do you want to ask this official question? You can answer it for everybody. Why don't you, why don't you ask it? Or not. Or do you want it to just be you? Either way, it doesn't matter. Yeah, doesn't matter. Yeah. Your answer might be good for everybody. But whatever, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll ask him and he'll, he'll answer it to everybody. <coughs> finish, finish your question. Oh, yeah. So, Sam, my team, went into Chile and up into Peru, and he met with... Bolivar. Bolivar. Do you have any idea what was said behind the closed doors? Yeah. You know, this has been one of the... <laughs> <coughs> You know, everybody wants to know that. What happened in that short, not that short, but this, this conference they have in Guayaquil, no? today, nowadays Ecuador. We don't know, you know, in fact. But what is clear is that San Martin had nothing in his back, you know. His, the state that gave birth to his army, you know, the United Provinces had collapsed. So, and Chile that had uh, given money for the expedition had retired his support because they had internal problems. So San Martin, in 1823, he was the commander of himself, you know. And Bolivar, on the contrary, in that moment he had created Colombia, you know, the, this big country that included what today's Colombia, plus Venezuela, plus Panama, plus Ecuador, and he had a giant army behind. So we don't know if Bolivar asked uh, San Martin, okay, I, I'll go there to finish the work, but you ha has not to be there. Or if San Martin said, okay, I don't want to be there. Because San Martin was already really tired and he wanted to retire. In fact, that's what he did after that. I mean, he, he went to, to his province and then uh, moved to Europe and he died there, okay? And he didn't want to in be involved in civil war. So what exactly happened, we don't know. But they say that San Martin offered Bolivar to be his subaltern, right? But, uh, and that Bolivar didn't want that. But we don't know. I would love to be there for a while <laughs> and be able to see what they say. Yes, at all. Yes, I mean, you know, when Ferdinand the Seventh came to power again, eighteen fourteen, he started to send troops to um, to South America and to Mexico too. You know, of course, the local loyalists were already fighting, but with the support of this of these veterans of the Napoleonic Wars, they won. You know, so th I didn't say that, but the situation in eighteen sixteen from what today is Argentina looked despair because they say Venezuela had fallen. Nueva Granada, what today is Colombia, had fallen again. What today is Mexico had fallen. Peru, Chile, all was in royalist hands. The only, in, in 1816, the only uh, rebel area that still wa were standing, it was standing, was uh, the Rio de la Plata, divided in two, you know, these federalists and, and centralists. But they were, so all the time they were fearing the coming of an expedition. And in fact, the expedition was organized in Spain and in, in 1820, when it was going to, how do you say that, to, yes, to, to, to go. I mean, they were embarking in the, in, the, in the ships, but some liberal officers of that army uh, made a, a revolution against Ferdinand VII, that, that is called the Liberal Revolution, that lasted from 1820 to 1823, right? So, and forced Ferdinand VII to, to, to take the liberal constitution again, and, well, that expedition that uh, started a civil war in Spain was going to invade Buenos Aires, yeah? and it was a big one. So things could have been different. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, I mean, uh, th there's an idea in Argentina very strong that um, all the slaves died in the war, and, uh, and so th that's why you don't have a strong black population in Argentina. W you know, something interesting is Uruguay still have a very important black population, but Argentina don't. This is not what historians think now. I mean, they, they don't think that all of them died, but they, they were like mixing with others, so it was like, like you know, 
vanishing, like the, the, especially because the identity was vanishing, or the, the ethnic identity. But uh, it is, I, I, I mean, sending them to the army had to do with, you know, there was pressure from, uh, and some anger in the slaves, so that was, you know, we give you freedom, but go and fight, right? And also, there was a special need of soldiers. I mean, because as it happens sometimes in wars, you know, in 1910, there were a lot of volunteers and people were, yeah, let's go, let's fight for freedom. But two years later, nobody wanted to go, right? So uh, they started to do the draft, and, and this forced recruitment caused a lot of anger among the upper classes. So they say, okay, let's use the slaves. In the beginning, because of Haiti, nobody wants to arm a slave, because they say, what can a sla an armed slave do, right? So, um, but in the end, they, they didn't have a choice, and, and it worked. You know, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, and s some of the, the of the former slaves ended up in, in, in Peru fighting even under Bolivar and then came back to, to what today is Argentina later in 1825. You know? So a lot of them died, but some others got freedom. Give him another hand. Thank you. Thank you.